So, Michael, a question for you. you. You showed this plant in Norway producing 200,000 tons per year of, of salmon. In the United States, we don't have a similar kind of infrastructure. So as we look towards developing um, supply chains and infrastructure that can actually help us produce seafood in the United States, what are the issues we face in, say, trying to get the efficiency that's an equivalent to what chickens have, particularly in light of uh, what you said, that we've got 400 species um, that are, in, in one fashion or another, in commerce? I think we're seeing sort of two trends going on. One, certainly, for part of the seafood supply, vertical integration and efficiency to get scale is going to be important in terms of driving down costs, reliability of supply, being able to work with large supermarket chains that rely on that reliable supply. Um, aquaculture in particular is well suited for that. Um, the work on genetics and genomics, I see Karen Rexroad in the back here who manages the Agricultural Research Services program in aquaculture. That, like for chickens, is driving down time to market, cost of production. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, the genome for a number of species have been sequenced now. Domestication is taking place, and we're going to see those things happen. It could be that shrimp farming comes back to the United States, not in ponds, but in recirculating systems, because the time to market is going, is now roughly 180 days from larvae to market size, if that comes down to 80 days or 60 days or 50 days, it makes land-based systems economical. Um, so that, that's happening on the one hand. On the other hand, you've got, well, what's the role going forward for smaller scale oyster farms, for individual boat captains in a world that wants to go to vertical integration and sort of more corporate models? I think there's going to be a lot of room for that, too, because we have this wide variety of species and technologies and locations and all politics is local in some ways. Um, so matching up you know, smaller, underutilized species or niche markets, um, the role for smaller farms and smaller fishing operations will be there for doing that. What, one little example, um, Chris Brown in Rhode Island, who, who fishes for scup in particular, which has like a 27% fillet yield. So it doesn't, it's not really conducive to going into a, a vertical integration with lots of processing. But he's working with ethnic communities in Providence, Rhode Island to sell them a whole fish for $2, so no processing. So as he said, it's a bunch of old white guys figuring out how to work with younger folks and people who don't look like them to market their fish as a success story. So Michael, when, one of the things that you face is not only do you have salmon, which is sort of like the, the charismatic top of the chain, but you have a, a, a bunch of other species too. How do you, how do you communicate um, and try to develop desire for some of the other lesser known species um, that would broaden our, um, our horizons as consumers? And uh, Alaska does have over 80 commercially fish species, so it's a variety to work with. However, the biggest challenge that we have is just creating a seafood consumer in general. And so we leverage the species that are familiar with people, such as salmon, and a lot of that has actually been because of the great influence that aquaculture has had for a consumer to become familiar with salmon, and then use that to be able to increase a consumer's interest and preference to be able to explore other species. And so that's how our marketing efforts work, both domestic and abroad, is you know, really being able to pair not just salmon or king crab or halibut in a marketing perspective for, let's say, China or Eastern Europe, but also making sure that pollock is out there and knowing that there's going to be a place for um, snow crab. There's also a place for you know, our other finfish species. So that's where you can see that it's a portfolio. It's not going to be one species that's going to win over a consumer. We can expand that once we get them to just start to eat maybe salmon or king crab or a farmed aquaculture fish. It really does create a seafood consumer in a bigger way. 
Seven's like the gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> so, but with the 80 species that you have, this is something that Michael mentioned, um, is that a lot of what is made in the United States is exported to be processed and comes back. Do you have the infrastructure in Alaska to handle all of these things? What happens with your supply chains? So just by way of background, we, by law, are supposed to label the country of origin for every seafood product. Uh, you can go into almost any grocery store and almost every fish isn't labeled. So people don't necessarily pay attention to the law, but, um, but it is there. So um, how do you manage the fish that goes out and comes back as a product of China or a product of Poland, and how, how are you reconciling your supply chains? That's a great question. Um, I think that's a two-part answer. The first part is, you know, what do we need to be able to have a more consolidated supply chain in Alaska? And that really comes back to the support that we receive um, to be able to innovate our processing sector. I think um, from the seafood science perspective, which is where I'm from, um, Alaska is the only state in the U.S. that doesn't get any agricultural funds from the federal government to be able to support innovation, product development, or utilization. Um, seafood is kind of disregarded as an agricultural component, and that's where I think working with ARS in the past has really helped us to be able to promote utilization and value-added processing in Alaska. Um, however, that support isn't, in, uh, isn't with us anymore. And so trying to be able to motivate that again so that we have a, a continued interest in being able to build that um, maybe more transparent supply chain is important. Um, the second part is how do we have transparency with the supply chain? Um, and that's a really hard area for us to be able to evaluate um, the, the main component of that is the value. Um, it's, it's very expensive to be able to process um, the natural variety of species that we have as well as the variability in production. And so we work with partners overseas for that, that production of, of our value-added product that then ends up coming back to the U.S. So when we think about farmed fish, Tiffany, one of the things that it seems to suffuse conversations in our culture is we have a reverence for farmers. So, you know, the, the dairy farmer, or there was a commercial a few years ago of a soybean farm, and it was this white house and a swing that was like 20 meters down in a tr from a tree and a girl in a white dress running barefoot over a perfectly manicured lawn. We revere the people who raise the food on land. And hunters, on the other hand, are viewed at best neutrally and largely with skepticism. The converse seems to be true for farming in the ocean. So the hunters are the people who are revered, and the story exists around them, and then uh, farmers are viewed with, at best, neutrality. Is there something that TNC can do to help with positioning and language and maybe creating a new narrative that could flip the conversation for people who farm in the ocean? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a great question. It's, um, it's kind of a deep philosophical question <laughs> in terms of our country and, and how and why we think the way we do. Um, I do think it's interesting that I would say that's pretty accurate for the U.S. You know, for globally, we have a pretty different perspective. A lot of different countries really view aquaculture in a very different way. So it's been part of the culture in, in China for thousands of years. And it hasn't been, kind of as Michael was mentioning, that it hasn't been as established here. Um, and I definitely think that some of the video series that we're doing that um, talk to, about people and the stories, um, talk about the farmers and their connection to the water in the similar way to watermen um, as an extension of 
um, like, like you were saying, there's many people that are younger that um, are sons and daughters of fishermen that are now going into aquaculture because they see that as an opportunity here in the U.S. And being able to highlight that story to say this is actually something pretty similar and these are still people that are working in the water, um, I think that is something that we can help with. And the video series that we've been doing that really does highlight that story because you're absolutely right. People connect to stories. People connect to people. <laughs> and if you can highlight those stories and highlight why people are doing what they're doing, what their why is, then I think that really resonates with the general public. Um, I do think there's a reason. I think it's interesting in terms of when you use the word revere in terms of farmers. It's true. And I think part of it, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but in the US, we have a very different idea of property rights of the marine space versus land. And so we tend to think of the marine space as something as a common pool resource that gets owned by everyone. And so fishers are going out to extract, and if they do so in a sustainable way, we respect that. We say, hey, you're, you're sustainably taking from a common pool resource, and we respect that. Aquaculturists, though, are more staking a claim kind of in the way that farmers are. And so I think there might not be as much of an acceptance of that because of the way we, we view water in this country. Um, just the inherent characteristics of it, the flow it tends to go, you know, it's, it's not as easily bounded <laughs> as land is. Um, and then there's a whole other thing around farmers and how we started this country, honestly. Um, agriculture was considered a way to own your property. It was something that you could stake your property rights on. If you were improving the land, if you were farming the land, then it was God's work. And that's why you hear of farmers being doing God's work. So do we need to rebrand aquaculture <laughs> as seafood farming? <laughs> in, in fact, I think there are some marketing studies that have been done for language use and um, fish farming is much better use of language than aquaculture. How do we create harvester in that as well? For a wild harvester, are we considered farmers as well? Well, so there, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, the salmon in Alaska is to some extent farmed and then released into the wild. No. It, it, well, it's raised in hatcheries, I, so, which are farms. But they're only raised in hatcheries to the extent that they're there for a couple of months at most, and then they're right. released into the wild. So right. it's not a farm product. No, but farming is part of the supply chain. It's an enhancement yeah. program. Yeah. It really does encourage the growth of the entire population of right. salmon. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. But I guess the, the problem that I can't understand if maybe Alaska seafood and other wild capture seafood, how do we categorize the harvesters as farmers as well. I mean, we also have an agricultural product. So do we fit into that same kind of nomenclature of a farmer that a harvester might? Well, I, would, I think it, it, it comes back, I think, to how I started this. I think that the people who are harvesting fish in Alaska sit in that revered category. So there's not, there's not a hurdle that they need to overcome to gain marketplace acceptance. You still have the enormous hurdle of this flat line for consumption that, that everybody in seafood faces. So your problem is a, a different set of problems perhaps than the set of problems that, that um, aquaculture owns. It, but we all own this issue of um, in whatever way that we have been speaking with people about the desirability of seafood, hoping that they'll increase their consumption. Um, so far, we haven't hit that. So, go ahead, Michael. So uh, some have written that we need to sort of get beyond this false dichotomy of farmed and wild in the I seafood sector. I think that sector. would be really helpful. Yeah. Um, it's really a range of technologies to produce seafood. I mean, you gave the, the example of hatcheries, or we can talk about nomenclature. Lobstering in Maine, 80 or 90 percent of the herring catch in New England goes into lobster traps, feeds lobsters all summer long. The lobsters are then harvested, held in a pound, which to, look, to me looks like a net pen. They're fed a medicated diet. Then they go to Nashville and places like that where they're held in cold storage before they go out UPS or FedEx. Is that farming or wild? If you go to coastal communities in Japan, they don't think about this that way the way we do. To them, it's a, it's a group of technologies, and the fishermen or the farmers are the same people. And 
they just use different technologies to gather that seafood. Um, so from a marketing perspective, you know, to consumers, it's seafood. Um, so I think in terms of how we tell the story, getting beyond the dichotomy maybe would help us. Well, so you and, and Tiffany both mentioned um, the relative environmental benefits of fish and seafood over beef cattle. So, Tiffany, the, um, a, a marketer of seafood and somebody who's actually out there with a product does well not to take shots at somebody else's product. Um, you can think it all the time. You're best not saying it, however. <laughs> you sit in a different place, though. And, um, and can speak to the relative merits of seafood over, say, for instance, beef cattle. Um, do, is this something that mm -hmm. you would consider taking on? Would you develop actually something that would say um, you can uh, have this very bad choice of a hamburger <laughs> or this delightful choice of a piece of fish? So, <laughs> so I do want to clarify that TNC um, also does work with the beef industry, and so I <laughs> just um, and um, I, so I, you I, I well, <laughs> you know, obviously I, I put the slide up, and it's something that we do believe in. We think that both can be part of our U.S. and global food industry. When we talk about seafood, though, in particular that we do have a really strong argument and belief that it can be really, really important for climate resilience. And so we have a changing climate right now where we're going to have less fresh water, we're gonna have less land, and seafood needs to be a huge part of that global food supply um, for carbon benefits, for land use benefits, for fresh water benefits. And so we feel very comfortable talking about that as, and what we do is we're, we're not an advocacy-based organization. So you might not realize, but nonprofits kind of go into science-based, advocacy-based, we don't sue people. <laughs> That's, there's a rule, there's a place for that, and lots of NGOs do a very good job of it. Um, it's not really what we do. We tend to be more of a collaborator and a convener, and we have about four to 500 scientists on our staff. So we really pride ourselves on being a science-based organization. So we develop the science, and then we actually do have educational materials that we develop out of that. And if partners want to use those, then we encourage them to, <laughs> and to say this is what we've produced. If you, if you find this of use and of value, please do so. Um, but in terms of our own priorities, one of our priorities is to grow the aquaculture industry in a sustainable way. We think that it is a really important part of our food system and that especially in the US that where we do have good regulatory strength and that's a lot of what we talk about internationally is that if you have a strong regulatory regime that can manage an aquaculture sector in a sustainable way then those are the areas where we really should be producing aquaculture because we have the water quality to be able to do so we have the regulations in place to create a safe and sustainable product so you mentioned that that the climate resiliency and the role that aquaculture can play in that. Um, Michael, y y to what extent do your fisheries and your harvests become challenged now by changing um, climactic conditions and the migration of phytoplanktonic species? Is, is this something that is in your planning, and to what extent does that play into what you all are doing? Uh, great question, and that's more directed towards possibly management and NOAA and state of Alaska. However, uh, to a testament for our harvesters, they have to adapt to those changes in population location as well as um, prey densities and understanding just how much effort has to go into being able to get to the fishing grounds and have that allocated into their seasonal programs for being able to catch their quotas. So yes, there are adaptations that the harvesters have had to do. Um, it does create variability in our products, so it makes it difficult for us to market something on a consistent basis like an aquaculture product does have. Um, so there's, I mean, I think the biggest word that can identify how we are able to work a, alongside climate change is resiliency and adaptability. I think those are the two things that our community of, of seafood harvesters and producers have, we've always lived with that. We're a wild producing 
organization, we need to be able to always have that in our back pocket. Yeah, no, I was going to ask you too. Well, another thing that's happening yeah. in Alaska is, and in other parts of the country is looking at other technologies to produce seafood too that fit with cultural traditions and coastal communities. And in Alaska, there are dozens of applications now to do kelp farming. Um, and in, in places like Maine, where they're afraid that the lobsters are all going to go up to Canada, um, they're thinking about the future too in terms of their coastal communities and lobstermen and kelp farming, uh, they're sort of different seasons, they work together, you can use the same equipment, the same boats, and so a number of families are doing a bit of both to sort of have a variety of different sources of income using a variety of technologies. Um, so that's one thing that's happening in terms of innovation around the country. One question I'd like all three of you to answer is, as we think about people making purchasing decisions, they're standing in the grocery store, what, what are the differences in thinking for a purchase decision for seafood versus the purchase decision for one of the terrestrial animals? So, Michael, I'll start with you. Tiffany, next, and then Michael last. Great question. Um, I kind of addressed this a little bit in my talk, but I think uh, what comes to mind most with what our surveys uh, are saying is that there's confusion when it comes to seafood. And, and that really comes back to that consistent messaging from the seafood sector, as well as understanding what we're messaging, um, how we're conveying that to the consumer. Um, there's also a, a distrust due to false labels um, in both our restaurant menus and our retail sector. So really being able to trust the person at the seafood counter to know their stuff um, and be able to communicate that. And that's what ASME strives to be able to do as well, is to make sure that there is a, um, that there is a chain of custody of education, essentially, to be able to make sure that the product that we are producing in Alaska goes to the distribution supply chain with the education and information that's associated with it. So that when it comes to Scott going up to the seafood counter at a retail store, that person's going to be able to communicate it to the customer in a way that is going to represent Alaska seafood. So I think that's a huge area that needs more, a lot more effort to be able to make sure that that communication is relayed. Um, and then that also represents the next step, which is the confusion to cook. A lot of people say in our surveys that they love the idea of working with seafood, but purchasing it for that high of a value and then not knowing if their cooking method is actually going to work ends up deterring them from purchasing seafood in general. So advocating for more groups to be able to have education, both in the culinary and, and consumer platforms, um, with groups like SMP and ASME and um, Barton Seavers Education Platform, those are all areas that we just, I think it needs to grow. I mean, that's really where we have that touch with the consumer so that they feel confident in purchasing seafood. Um, and then I think the biggest aspect around it is that the convenience factor. Um, that's where, like I said, we're really slow to adapt just because of the way that our seafood industry is oriented, um, having more uh, product types and convenience foods that are associated with seafood is just going to be an easier way to be able to get a consumer on board. Um, I'll speak a little bit more to kind of the environmental lens, and because I think I completely agree with you. I think there's a lot of confusion, a lot of just lack of knowledge from the consumer, but um, part of that is that there's so many more species within seafood than there are within our land base. So you have so many more options in terms of the information you need to wade through. Um, but on the terrestrial side, I think a lot of people environmentally will say, okay, is it organic or not organic? And that's kind of a distinction. And um, they don't really care where it's raised as necessarily as it has that you know, organic label on it. And they're thinking, okay, I'm making a better choice in this regard. And there's a lot of different labels within seafood, and people get a little bit confused by that to say, okay, am I looking for? And so that's why people tend to sometimes go between the farmed and wild. <laughs> and um, they think that's the distinction rather than where it's raised and how it's raised. Um, so there's some labels that um, have probably more public you know, perception or public acceptance.
Americans than others, like ASC MSC. But um, something that I will tell people is the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch, you know, app. Um, that it's relatively easy; you can download it. Get, but even that's a lot of information <laughs> for the for the average consumer. So I think that um, more education about that. I think the person that you're talking to behind the counter is the most important person. It really is. Um, most people who are going to be buying seafood are looking to see is it fresh and what does the person behind the counter say about it. And so if we have more education programs for those staff, um, I think that's something that can be a huge amount of um, just benefit. Um, but again, some of these apps have a lot of potential as well if people are willing to download them and use them and actually trust them. So um, there are some global programs going on right now that are looking to kind of certify the certifiers by using the UN guidelines. And I think that might be a solution to this as well so that we could have one label that people recognize and trust as something that's more environmentally sustainable. Well, I think a lot of the, the methods of how we get there have been described by my colleagues here. Um, you know, good for people, good for the planet, good for communities. But it's going to take a lot of work in terms of creating an overall brand for seafood over the next couple of years to get so to this proverbial tipping point that we've been at for a long time in terms of seafood consumption. Um, and you know we're not there yet in terms of got milk or pork the other white meat with seafood. But I think we have all the tools and part of the story in terms of putting a human face on it to get to that point. So that's our collective challenge going forward. So one place where the marketing and presentation of seafood has been done excellently is by the work of Seafood Nutrition Partnership. And what these guys do when they go out and they're in the various cities that they address, and you'll hear some of this this afternoon with uh, a, a prototype program called Seafoodies, where they w went into a market and really did increase the amount of seafood that people were consuming and they changed attitudes and they were able to m measure that and they were able to make specific communications that resonated with people. And I, I think that's the work that we're all trying to do. Um, it it's crucial that we eat more seafood and, and we've heard so many reasons today why that's true. So I want to applaud the Seafood Nutrition Partnership for the work that they do. I'm so proud to be a member of their advisory body. It's just one of the greatest things that I can imagine because they're so successful at what they do. And now the rest of us need to go out. Each of you, this coming weekend, I want you to go to your grocery store, stand there and talk to somebody, tell them how to cook a fish, and tell them, buy that one. Because it works. Don't take your kids. They'll be embarrassed. <laughs> but you go do it yourself. Thank you guys very much for taking the time to, to prepare remarks and think about what would be helpful. And Pardon? Oh, we do. Oh, I, th I saw the. Oh, that's for you. Oh. I, so I just saw that hit one second, and I thought, wonderful. Okay, yeah, so happy to take questions then. Hi, Ellen Shutt with GoEd. This is probably a question for Tiffany. Um, so while I agree with what Scott said at the beginning of the conversation about you're not going to get people to consume more seafood because of the EPA or DHA content, I wonder if you have conversations as you're looking at building these aquaculture communities or developments, are you talking about the fish feed and, and, and is there interest in the omega-3 content to make sure it's not just healthy fish but healthy people too? Yeah, no, absolutely. So we actually have some partnerships where we are specifically looking at uh, fish-free fish free feeds in some ways, but also making sure that it still has nutritional components that is necessary. Sometimes um, algae is a potential um, ingredient for some of these fish feeds because we don't want to get into a fish-in, fish-out situation when it comes to aquaculture. But um, feed is incredibly important for <laughs> you know how nutritious the fish is at the other end. Um, and we also focus on nutrition as well in terms of some of the studies and work 
work that we're doing internationally. So we're, we have a partnership right now with Harvard where we're looking actually at building nutrition in to uh, life cycle analysis for to how environmentally friendly certain um, farmed fish can be and also saying and then what should the feed be for that fish and what fish should be grown in countries for food security. So we've just piloted that for Bangladesh and we're going to be starting in the next few months for Indonesia which is a country that we work quite a bit in. So I do a lot of my work in seaweed. Yeah, so, so I had a question about um, the goal of increasing seafood consumption. And, and a couple of you mentioned at the retail market and, and the role there, but one of the things that I've noticed in the Midwest is that maybe we don't have the best educated people behind the seafood counter, and sometimes it stays there too long, and you have a bad experience with the seafood. I mean, how, how do we address this problem? I mean, obviously there's a lot of levels here, cooking, but uh, I mean, one, we, there's a market near my house that I usually go to the meat counter, even though I would prefer to eat seafood to meat. But I've had too many bad experiences and too many conversations. Like Scott, I've, you know, I don't want to smell the fish when I walk in the door and I'm in the produce section, that kind of thing. So how, how do we deal with that issue? <laughs> uh, I'll take a stab at that. Um, <laughs> Uh, we develop curriculum to be able to support education with our partners on the retail side. Um, and so when we do go out and have collaborative efforts with certain retail establishments, we encourage them to also take what we consider a seafood university course. So really making sure that their staff is going to be educated on how to be able to not only identify the different species that are coming to the seafood counter, but also be able to convey messaging that relates back to the origin, the harvesting type, um, what kind of attributes are associated with that fish. So um, whether or not that's going to be relayed to every staff member that's at the retail counter, that's hard to say, but we do encourage that as, as we partner and make sure that Alaska Seafood's a part of the seafood counter, we want them to know and use that information when they talk to consumers. A lot of people when they come into a, a retail store, they want to come into the meat department. And if they can't get a job in the meat department, then they're shunted off to seafood. So what you've got is an employee who doesn't have the job that they wanted, but they have a job that they don't want. And so that irritation is palpable at some time. So there are some markets, for instance, Whole Foods and Wegmans are two markets in the United States where people want to go to the seafood counter. So one of the things to do is almost a first chore is to give them enough knowledge and talking points that they can actually be transformed to being happy about being there. So the language then becomes, what would you like, how can I help you, rather than, what do you want? <laughs> Which is what we encounter a lot. So I salute you for doing that. I've just seen that to be really important. And a seafood doesn't keep as long as meat. So I, I wonder sometimes if the management of the store is not also involved in this to a certain degree, that, because it's an expensive product, it's not moving, they don't want to throw it away, that sort of thing. So I think there is room for a lot of education here uh, with folks. So, so one of the things that is important is to deal with the weakness of fresh seafood versus flash frozen frozen seafood and canned seafood. The community I'm interested in and trying to communicate this message, they, they're in a food desert. There's one supermarket in, in a 50 mile radius. So if they go get fresh food, it's already a, an hour or so to get back home, and then it sits in, in the fridge or on the countertop. So if it didn't smell when it was, you go to the fish counter, by the time they get around and put it on the table as a meal, 
uh, you've got a problem, and you've got so many people ill-trained to handle fresh seafood that the important thing for a vertically integrated, high-throughput business, which is what 21st century is going to, it's all agribusiness and aquaculture business. The, the small farmer is not the thing. So there ought to be more attention to canned seafood because of its convenience as well as the flash frozen. Those are modern introductions to the food chain that prevent the problem with seafood. I was born in Missouri, and the Midwest is loaded with stores that have overripe seafood on the counters because people just don't realize. And then the housewives and the husbands that do the cooking, uh, they want a convenient thing that's reliable and trustworthy. And seafood can do it when it's canned and when it's flash frozen, but not when some clerk who's ill-educated handles it. So I'd like to hear the panel really talk about how quickly can we get to the canned and the frozen, because that's what the housekeeper, the cook at home, they want the convenience. They want to come in. They work in two jobs. They want to grab something from the shelf and they, or the freezer and put a meal on the table in 20 minutes. Well, Michael, do you guys have specific programs for helping people deal with frozen fish and understanding how to use it? Yeah, we have a Cook It Frozen program. Um, it's about educating consumers how to cook with frozen. We also talk and message a lot about working with frozen quality. So, you know, it's not only at the retail side, but also food service that it's important to educate on frozen quality. Not only is it going to be uh, a different process in the supply chain in terms of time out of the water, everybody knows that the quality of seafood can never be improved, it can only be sustained. So the second it gets out of the water, that's where your ticking time clock is for quality. And so by freezing it, and which it represents around 96% of our product from Alaska is frozen seafood. So we really try to convey that that frozen quality is something that will be what the consumer experiences when they take seafood out of the freezing aisle at the grocery store or if it's refreshed and then put out and slacked out at a retail counter, you've really locked in that fresh caught flavor, the quality, um, it's preserved the, the sensitive tissues of fish that are different from other meat proteins. And so yes, it's definitely a huge part of our marketing effort. Um, I think that the problem with canned seafood and why you don't see a lot more recognition is that there's a lot, not a lot of demand, but also there's a lot of um, hesitancy by the retail establishments to open more space for canned product. So when canned product is available in the retail area, it's very small. There's not a lot of space for it to be able to um, share the market with other canned products um, in that aisle. So uh, there's a little bit of a problem with um, how much volume can go into a retail establishment and what's available to a consumer. Uh, just, just a follow-up then. Uh, in in the store I'm talking about, they have expanded their canned seafood counter to about 25 foot now when it used to be only 8 or 10 feet. So canned food is what they do. And if you look at the USDA 100 most eaten foods in the United States, the seafood that Americans eat is canned tuna. And I'm trying to get them to eat canned albacore instead of light tuna because then they're going to get more of the omega-3 nutrients. That light tuna just isn't the same. But canned tuna is what Americans eat. If you want to go into the fish consumption of Americans, if I believe USDA, it's canned tuna. And I know, having started out as a shrimp farmer, that if the shrimp goes from the pond to an ice bath to the processing plant within hours, I can't tell the difference in taste. So I can't, for the life of me, figure out why shrimp at a seafood counter is flawed. Yeah. It yeah. should all be, and some supermarkets now sell it only frozen. That makes a lot of sense. But there's room for both fresh and wild. 
in the marketplace. Yeah, it's interesting the that in, in Japan, a fish isn't fresh unless it's been frozen. Whereas in the United States, a fish isn't fresh if it has been frozen. The, the different point of view is, I think, pretty interesting. Uh, is that, okay, thank you very much. And thank you all.